Can you imagine life in Los Angeles without roads, ports, and railways? Hi everyone, Ken here. Welcome to this house. In 1851, Phineas Banning headed out west to found the town of Wilmington, California, which would later be incorporated by Los Angeles. He began connecting LA to other major Californian cities by building the area's first railways. Phineas then expanded his growing transportation empire to include shipping by building the first breakwater, earning him the title the father of the Port of Los Angeles, which in present day receives about 20% of the nation's imports. Now that LA was connected to the rest of the developed world, the city began to grow exponentially, and every time someone used his railway and his port, Phineas made more money. By 1863, he had made a fortune, and with that fortune, he decided to build his dream house. He chose a large tract of land in Wilmington, not too far from his port, and built a 30-room Greek Revival-style mansion. It was surrounded by lush, perfectly manicured gardens with a driveway lined by the first eucalyptus trees to ever be planted in the state of California. The simple, but stately mansion was finished out with grand window surrounds behind a gallery porch, all set below a four-story cupola. The interior of the home was planned around a central stair hall running the length of the house, with all of its public rooms arranged to either side. Upon entering the home, we can gain a sense of the grandeur of this space, with period wallpaper and millwork crafted from old-growth lumber. To the right-hand side is the parlor, staged with settees conversationally arranged in front of an elaborate fireplace. The windows are covered with heavy drapes, which was considered stylish at the time, and the room is illuminated by a crystal gasolier. Just beyond the pocket door, we will find the dining room, featuring both painted and unpainted millwork. The family would have sat at this table for every meal, which was catered by their staff. We can go ahead and take a look behind the scenes to see the butler's pantry, which connects to the kitchen. The kitchen was furnished with state-of-the-art appliances in large windows to allow for plenty of circulation on the hottest of summer days. Let's make our way back into the stair hall and continue exploring the first floor. Directly across the stair hall from the dining room is the family room, doubling as a library. It was a more intimate space for the Banning family to gather. Books were stored in the glass pane bookcases, but the real showstopper in this room was the hearth. We can take a closer look at the hand-carved artisan details found on the mantel before continuing on. Attached to this room was Mr. Banning's office, appearing rather simple and reserved when compared to the rest of the house. The only adornments were a picture rail, so as to not damage the plaster when hanging photos, and a colorful, patterned carpet. Heading upstairs, we will arrive in the second floor stair hall and begin exploring the bedrooms. First, we will see the daughter's room, decorated with sophisticated furniture and dotted with doll accessories along the back wall. Next, we will see the son's room. We can notice the water basin along the back wall. This is where he would have freshened up every morning before coming downstairs for breakfast. But before either of the children got their own rooms, they would have started life in the house in the nursery. Mr. and Mrs. Banning had the largest bedroom on the second floor, with plenty of space to rotate about their four-poster bed. Their bathroom, while small by today's standards, would have been considered the epitome of luxury in its day, as most of the homes of the time period did not have indoor plumbing. Let's head back into the second floor stair hall and continue our tour to the third floor. This floor was considerably less ornate than the other two floors, with the walls and ceilings finished out with beadboard. Up here we will find the sewing room, where the maid would have mended any tears in the family's clothing. And while she was busy doing this, she could have kept an eye on the kids in their playroom just around the corner. Finally, we can open the door on the left and head up the tight staircase to the crow's nest. This was said to be Mr. Banning's favorite room in the house, where he could bring guests and show off the views of his vast property. He lived happily in this house for the rest of his life, until 1885, when he was run over by a horse and buggy while visiting San Francisco. The house continued to be lived in by his family, until it was purchased by the city of Los Angeles in 1927, with plans to make the estate a fine park for the ever-growing community to enjoy. After a few years of planning the park, the city decided to restore the Banning House and open it as a house museum. 
The Banning family was moved by this notion and donated most of the house's original furnishings to the museum for guests to enjoy the house as it was when it was built. Today, the Banning House continues to be open to the public as a house museum. Did you have a favorite room? Let me know down below in the comments section. And while you're there, make sure to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House.